Well, please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the gift of kids. Thank you for the gift of free will, that we can step in and do what you want us to do. Thank you that you love us even for the times that we don't always do what you ask us to do, like love our enemies. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to see you all. Um, as I said at the beginning of the 8 o'clock sermon, my apologies to Father Chris. I'm ignoring the reading from Romans. Uh, we've been in Romans all summer, which has been fantastic. It's been a nice study. But I read it and I was like, eh, I'm going to go with the gospel. Uh, so, several years ago, a couple of friends decided to start a business together. Specifically, they decided to start a candy business together. And their specialty was like the little chocolate hearts. Like, you know, the ones you give to your sweetheart on Valentine's Day. However, instead of being, them being in the shape of a heart, they were made to look like the actual organ that is beating inside of our chest, pumping blood through our bodies. So like you unwrap this little chocolate from your significant other and there in your hand is an anatomically correct looking heart. Like with the four chambers and everything. They even put a little like red dye where the aorta is coming into the first chamber. Hilarious, right? It was a disaster. Like on every level that you measure a business venture, it did not succeed. For whatever reason, a four chamber chocolate heart didn't remind people of all the things we tend to think about when we use the word heart. You know, words like love, together, compassion, fiance, happiness, deep passion, peace, tenderness, open, grace. And of course, everyone's favorite, baby otters. I mean, come on, right? If you're watching a video of baby otters and you don't say, oh my gosh, they're so cute, do you even have a heart? People use that phrase, I have a heart for, insert people or organization or whatever, to express how much they care about those things or people. If you look on your phone, there are 40 different emojis that include a heart. Love and kisses and relationships and care, the list goes on and on. When we hear the word heart, this is, these are the kinds of things that typically come to mind. And then we heard this morning's gospel passage, out of the human heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and everyone's favorite, slander. These are the words of Jesus, and I did not hear him mention baby otters once. Now, maybe it's just me, but I'm wondering if Jesus' view of the human heart might differ slightly from ours. Which brings up a very important point. When we hear or read things from the Bible that challenge us and don't line up with what we already think and believe, we have to have the courage to ask questions. Why would Jesus think and say such things? What is going on just before Jesus says these things? What is the context? Now, for all the religious people in the room and those joining us online, you're not gonna like this. Let me strike that. We're not going to like this because just before we hear Jesus say this, Jesus is having a conversation with, you guessed it, a bunch of religious people. And these religious leaders were feeling a tad, how can we say it? Lofty, greater, grander, holier than thou. I know it's hard for us to imagine this, but these leaders who definitely saw themselves as like the religious upper class, they were attempting to point out the faults and the sins of other people. They were attempting to get Jesus's disciples in trouble because they weren't saying the right words, they weren't doing the right things, they weren't eating with the right people. It was the theological equivalent of, you're looking kind of dumb with your finger and your thumb in the shape of an L on your forehead. To which Jesus responds and basically says to them, wait, wait, do you guys actually think that if you say the right things and follow all the religious rules, that that's what it means to be pure in heart? 
because it's not. It's what goes in that makes us unclean and impure. Our hearts, they've already got all sorts of nasty things coming out of them, which is, brings us back to the list that Jesus uses. Evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and everyone's favorite slander. Now at this point, as I'm reading the story, maybe this hasn't happened to you, but as I'm reading the story, I am putting myself in the position of Jesus' disciples. And upon Jesus sort of like saying to like the high and lofty religious leaders and putting them in their place, I'm like, yeah, who's the loser now? Loser? Which is always so helpful, right? It's so helpful when we do, when we as humans, or worse yet, when we as humans are trying to follow the way of Jesus, whenever we have just the slightest moment of gaining an advantage or winning an argument or gaining some political ground or reading something online that strengthens our bias, we do exactly what Jesus teaches us to do and we go, <laughs> And I can't help but think, and I'm wondering if Jesus just knows that his disciples are gonna go there. And so he chooses to teach them and us a lesson. Now I'm gonna hit the pause button for just a sec. I'm gonna get all Bible nerdy on you for a moment and then we'll get back to the story. One of the things that we do, and I say we because I do this too, one of the things that we do with the Bible is we ignore where things take place. Like the location of where Jesus says and does things is often just as, if not more important than what Jesus says and does. Matthew 15 is a perfect example of this. If you were to sort of scroll back in the text, scroll back, I just made that, Never mind. Okay. Um, and that, that was unintentional, by the way. Um, if, you, if you scroll back in the decks, you find that Jesus and his disciples are like on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. It's a really Jewish area of the world at that time. But in response to these like religious leaders and Jesus' disciples sort of like exchanging superiority complexes, Jesus brings his followers to the district of Tyre and Sidon, which is in the current country of Lebanon. And if you look on a map, Jesus, from where they were, takes his followers on a 20-mile hike field trip in order to teach them a lesson about feeling superior to other people. And so the story continues. Along comes this Canaanite woman. Now, she's not one of them. She does not worship the same God. She is, by definition, unclean. Jesus and his followers absolutely should observe the rules and the words of scripture and avoid her, not touch her, send her away, keep her distant, which is exactly what Jesus' disciples do. They follow the teachings of their ancient texts and tell Jesus to send her away. Now, here's the part of the story where Jesus, it feels like on the surface that he turns into a really big jerk. He says and does things that feel to us downright mean, rude, and dismissive. But this woman persists. Remember, 20 miles ago, Jesus' disciples were basically accused of not getting it, of being like religiously inferior. And then Jesus reminds the accusers that they're worried about all the bad things coming into us, but actually all those things are already there in our hearts. And in response, Jesus' disciples are super happy because ha, now who's the loser, right? And along comes this woman begging for help from Jesus, and at first he snubs her? The text says he did not answer her at all. Now I feel like by his silence, Jesus is kind of letting his followers sort of hang themselves. It's like by him not saying anything, his followers start to put her into that category where they just put the religious leaders as well. She doesn't get it. And we already know that Jesus only hands out healing and love and mercy to the people who already get it. You know, the winners, not the losers. She says to Jesus, Lord, help me. Is there a more powerful prayer that anyone can pray? She is desperate, and Jesus knows it. So with his disciples watching and listening to everything he's doing, and this is where Jesus starts to sound like a real piece of work, he says, 
It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Is he calling her a dog? And does she then agree with Jesus? Because she basically backtalks to Jesus and says, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And in response to that, Jesus tells her how great her faith is and then heals her daughter. What just happened? First of all, if we believe that God is love, then it would seem that Jesus isn't being rude or mean to this woman who is in need of mercy. And so I kind of like to lean into this concept of Jesus is doing a massive sort of theological head dodge or fake out with his disciples, with us by extension. Because imagine, if you can, Christians saying things like, well, we're so great because we follow Jesus and we're better than those people. And Jesus doesn't say anything, just lets us keep thinking. And then those people continue to be those annoying people, which only just feeds our belief that they're awful and we're great. They're the losers, we're the winners. And then Jesus turns to them, not to us, to them and says to them, how great is your faith? No, no, no. That's not how this works, Jesus. That's not how Christianity works. See, we're the ones who receive the mercy of God, not them. Again, important point. Whenever we read or hear something in the Bible that doesn't line up with what we already think and believe, we need to be strong and courageous, not be afraid, and ask questions. Because what if that is actually how Christianity works? How far does the mercy and love and grace of God extend? Is there a limit to it? Is the love of God truly unconditional? Because this woman gets it. She's got nowhere left to turn. She's at the end of her rope. Lord, help me. It's a simple prayer, by the way, and it's one that is commended in other parts of the Jesus story. When a lofty religious leader prays, Lord, thank you, I am not like this tax collector. And the tax collector says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Cornelius the centurion says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter my house. The Canaanite woman, the centurion, that tax collector, they are exactly what Jesus speaks of in the Beatitudes when he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Being pure in heart isn't about making sure you're doing all the right things and saying all the right things. It's about being honest in our need for God, for forgiveness, for mercy, for love. Jesus never says, great is your faith to the people who already claim to be great, thinking they're better than others. If you remember the words of Isaiah, because Jesus is here to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom to those who are oppressed. And the fact that Christianity has a reputation of being smug and intolerant and exclusive and superior means that we probably need Jesus more than they do. I want to close with a prayer written by a Lutheran pastor friend of mine. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we are indeed losers who don't get it. And like the Canaanite woman, we are on our knees begging for mercy and healing and help. We've made a mess of things here in this world, and frankly, we don't know what to do, and posting things on social media just isn't helping. So Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on all of us. And bring us some healing, Lord. Bring it. Bring it in our hearts and in our lives and in our world. Because today we are holding your feet to the fire, God. Because you promised. You promised to be with us and to bring salvation and new life. And even if it is nothing but the crumbs from your table, and even if we are but dogs, we are boldly claiming those promises as our own and reminding you to show up 
and do for us what we simply cannot do ourselves. Amen.